Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're embodying the Halloween spirit to get all those spooky scares and chills we all desire. So tonight, sit back as we dive into some of the most haunted places in Vermont. So I figured we'd start with probably the most infamous haunted spot in the state. Emily's Bridge, also known as Gold Brook Covered Bridge, is nestled in the heart of Vermont in the town of Stowe. The bridge was built in 1844 and spans just over 50 feet long. While the exact records are still unknown, it is said sometime shortly after the bridge was built, there was a young woman named Emily who was planning to elope with her boyfriend. However, after waiting for what seemed like forever, Emily finally got fed up. While the story differs slightly, the most told version is that Emily had hanged herself from the bridge. The story is already sad and very tragic on its own, but it's still not over. Stories started emerging as time passed, but it's said in the 1960s and 70s the stories really took off. People who visited the bridge had started to report hearing a faint woman's voice when they visited during the night. There's also many reports of cars being scratched as they passed over the bridge. People have also reported even being able to see Emily herself in her wedding dress standing at the end of the bridge, waiting for her lover. Many people have come to visit the spot and do their own explorations of the place. The story has become so popular, in fact, even the town of Stowe has supported it and you can find lots of Emily's Bridge memorabilia around the town. And sadly, historians have looked into this and it has been debunked pretty easily. But when so much stuff keeps happening, who's to really say for sure? The Milton Co-op Dairy Creamery, or the Creamery for short, is definitely the most special place to me on this list. There are a few different stories revolving around this spooky place. It was originally built in 1919 and lasted all the way to the late 60s and early 70s before finally going out of business and being deserted. The past five decades haven't been very nice to the place as it's left looking just as scary as the stories surrounding it. One of the most infinite stories is the one of the worker who got broiled alive. It said sometime in the 30s or 40s there was a worker who was doing his usual tasks of making powdered milk when somehow he slipped and fell into the giant vat that was used for processing. It said his screams could be heard, but by the time the authorities got there, his skin had already been broiled off his flesh, and it was determined he could not be rescued and was left to die in the broiling milk vat. People say they can still hear the screams of the employee when they enter the room where the vat is. While there's not any certified evidence of this exact event happening, there was a story from the 40s of a boy who died in the factory before any child labor laws were active. Another chilling case from here is the story of the homeless man who accidentally burned himself alive. It's believed that sometime in the 1980s, a man experiencing homelessness was using the creamery for shelter during a cold winter night. To stay warm overnight, he decided to start a fire. The story from here varies, with the biggest theory being that the fire just got too big while he was sleeping, and due to him being under the influence, he just didn't wake up and died in his sleep. A more sinister theory recalls a group of teenagers who decided to either light the man on fire directly or let a trail of gasoline from the fire to the man as some sort of sick joke. While there's no verified reason for his burning, the charred remains of the couch still remain to this day. The Bennington Triangle, centered around Glattonsbury Mountain in Vermont, has long been known for strange events including UFO activity, Bigfoot sightings, strange lights and sounds, and the location where five people disappeared between the 1940s and the 1950s. The first disappearance occurred on November 12, 1945 when 74-year-old Mitty Rivers disappeared while out hunting. The morning of November 12, 1945, Rivers and his son-in-law Joe Lousen were walking together before reaching a fork. Rivers and Lousen would separate here, with Rivers telling Lousen he'd only be going a short distance before he would rejoin them at the camp for lunch. As 3pm had come and gone, the rest of the hunting party would begin searching before getting authorities involved. An extensive search was conducted, but the only evidence discovered was a single rifle cartridge that was found in a stream. The speculation was that Rivers had leaned over and the cartridge had dropped out of his pocket into the water. Rivers was an experienced outdoorsman who was familiar with the local area. 18-year-old Paula Jean Weldon disappeared on December 1, 1946. Weldon, a sophomore at Bennington College, had set out for a hike on the long trail. She was reported to not be wearing a jacket during her journey, and it was reported to be 50 degrees outside, dropping down to 9 degrees that night. Weldon was alleged to have been seen on the trail herself by an elderly couple who were about 100 yards behind her. 
According to them, she turned a corner in the trail, and when they reached the same corner, she had disappeared. An extensive search was conducted, which included the posting of a $5,000 reward and help from the FBI, but no evidence of her was ever found. James E. Tedford allegedly went missing on December 1, 1949. Three years to the day after Weldon was last seen, Tedford, a resident of the Bennington Soldiers' Home, had been in St. Albans visiting relatives and was accompanied to a local bus station which was the last location where he was seen. According to witnesses, Tedford got on the bus and was still aboard the last stop before arriving in Bennington. Somewhere between his last stop and Bennington, he vanished. His belongings were still in the luggage rack and an open bus timetable was on his vacant seat. Tony Jenks discusses this claim saying that the popular conception is that he vanished into thin air while on the bus, but like many missing person stories, there's a gap between when he was last seen and when he was reported, missing a week or so later. Regarding Tetford's disappearance, there's enough evidence to suggest he didn't dematerialize even though no trace of him was ever found. On October 12, 1950, Paul Jepson, aged 8, had accompanied his mother in a truck. She left her son unattended for about an hour while she went to go feed some pigs. While she returned, her son was nowhere in sight. Search parties were formed to look for the child. Nothing was ever found, though Jepson was wearing a bright red jacket that should have made him more visible. According to one story, bloodhounds tracked the boy to a local highway, where according to a local legend, Weldon had disappeared four years earlier. On October 28, 1950, 16 days after Jepson had vanished, Frida Langer, age 53, and her cousin, Herbert Elsner, left their family campsite near the Somerset Reservoir to go on a hike. During the journey, Langer slipped and fell into a stream. She told Elsner if he would wait, she would go back to the campsite, change clothes, and catch up to him. When she did not return, Elsner made his way back to the campsite and discovered that Frida Langer had never returned and that nobody had seen her since they left. Over the next two weeks, five searches were conducted involving aircraft, helicopters, and up to 300 searchers. No trace of Langer was found during the search. On May 12, 1951, her body was found three and a half miles from the campsite in an eastern branch of the Deerfield River, an area that had only been lightly searched seven months earlier. No cause of death could be determined because of the condition of her remains. No direct connections have been identified that tie these cases together, other than the general geographic area and time period. That was a lot, I know, but we're still not done with this place. Besides the strange disappearances, another strange thing here is the amount of supposed Bigfoot sightings in the area. Sometimes called the Glattons Berry or Bennington Monster, Bigfoot sightings have been reported for decades, with them even being popular enough to land a spot on Traveling Channel's TV show, Most Terrifying Places in America. Don't worry, there's still more places to add to your next trip. Let's move our attention to Manchester, more specifically, the inns at the Equinox. The complex has a history that dates to 1769 in our American Revolution. Originally called Marsh Tavern, it was the place where Ira Allen proposed taking property that belonged to the Tories in order to raise money to buy weapons for his brother Ethan's militia. The infamous Green Mountain Boy spent a fair amount of time strategizing and drinking in Marsh Tavern, and it's speculated that the spirits still have their nightly drink there. Visitors have reported numerous strange events such as the rocking chairs rocking themselves and hearing the sounds of glasses clinking. But the most strange occurrence happened in room 329 when a whole family reported seeing their bed move on its own, one leg post at a time. During the incident, Robert Cullinan, a security guard who had been called to the scene, was pushed so hard by an invisible entity that he nearly fell to the floor. Well, we're finally coming off to a close, so I figured we'd leave off with the most notorious place in Vermont, our own university in the heart of Burlington. UVM is said to be one of, if not the most haunted college in America. Several buildings and locations claim to have their own spooky associations with them. Let's start with what's now the Counseling Center. This structure was built in 1850 by Captain John J. Jones for his dear friend Captain John Nabb, who lived there very happily until he died 27 years later in 1877. It was his dream house, courtesy of Captain John Jones. People have reported seeing an apparition of John Nabb in the home that was renovated and transformed into the Counseling Center. There have been reports of Nabb slamming doors, shutting windows, and knocking items over. The Bittersweet House, which is a facility for the environmental program, is considered one of the most haunted areas on campus. People report seeing full-body apparitions of a woman named Margaret Smith who owned the building from 1928 to 1961. She moved into her new house widowed as her late husband died in a car accident. These sightings are so vivid, people describe her as having neat hair and wearing a long dress. 
Converse Hall is also no stranger to the paranormal. According to various online sources, Converse Hall is haunted by the ghost of a student who hanged himself in the attic in the 1920s. The stress of the academia was more than he could endure, but even death gave him no escape since his spirit still lingers in the dorm. Some sources say the ghost's name is Henry. Henry has been accused of causing various spooky phenomena in the dorm, like knocking mirrors off the walls, tearing down posters, slamming doors shut, and rearranging furniture in students' rooms. There's also another story of a student hanging themselves in the building in the 1980s in the same hall who was going to school for engineering. People often report lights flickering on and off and radios getting louder or turning themselves off. It's safe to say, UVM and the state it embodies is definitely home to lots of strange and spooky places. There's so much more I couldn't get to in this video, so I guess you'll have to wait for next year. Thank you all so much for watching, I always appreciate it, and I'll see you in the next video.